live. Great. Well, good morning. Uh, this is the House Transportation Committee on, can you believe it, March 1st. Um, so uh, this morning we're starting our day with uh, someone who's very familiar to this committee. Uh, in this committee room, we're happy to have Sue Minter, um, the Executive Director of Capstone Community Action, and Paul Zabriskie, the Director of Weatherization and Climate Impact, um, to talk about uh, mobility transportation initiative grants, which are... Um, a component of the transportation budget and uh, our bill. So welcome to the committee. Um, if you could just identify yourselves for the record and uh, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to. Great, well, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of this esteemed committee. Um, for the record, I'm Sue Minter, Executive Director of Capstone Community Action, um, which I'll explain what we do in a minute. Um, and I am joined by the Director of Weatherization and Climate Impact for Capstone, Paul Zabriskie. Um, and I think I just want to say that it's always great to be in this room where I had the opportunity to serve, uh, as do you right now, as well as serving uh, and coming to this body as uh, a member of the executive branch, uh, both as the deputy and secretary of this great agency, best agency in state government, um, and also as the Irene Recovery Officer. So that uh, painting is also really powerful and meaningful to me. So thank you for uh, letting us join you today. And I think what we are here to do is really tell you about, I think something uh, that is a success, uh, that is an outgrowth of the work that this committee has been uh, planting the seeds for and developing the opportunity uh, for innovation in our microtransit work. Um, I feel very proud of the ways in which uh, the state of Vermont invests in transit, in public transportation, um, and have worked, uh, we have worked closely with the agency to develop this program, uh, which is called Community Rides Vermont. Um, let's see if our uh, Zoom is gonna go through forward. We are Capstone Community Action. This is our beautiful uh, headquarters in um, Barrie, just down the road, and we invite you to visit us anytime. Capstone is actually a community action agency, which is an anti-poverty organization. Uh, we were really born out of the war on poverty in the 1960s, established in 1965, and we are part of a network of community action agencies around the state, all of whom serve your constituencies. And we serve low, moderate, and very low income Vermonters in a range of services and programs. We focus on addressing people in crisis, whether it's food, uh, access, uh, housing, uh, focusing on folks who are insecure or unhoused uh, or heat uh, through the winter. But we also build what we call ladders out of poverty. And we try to find innovative ways to fill the gaps that the barriers that really keep people in poverty. And that's where this program really sits. Um, we are really building an opportunity, leveraging the federal public transit money that you all appropriate, uh, as well as the MTI innovation grants that you have really begun, to think about how do we build upon our existing uh, public transit uh, system, uh, but to innovate and to leverage partnerships with our businesses, with our philanthropic community, uh, looking at opportunities in the climate space uh, to really build what we call a transportation equity program. And this is a service of all electric vehicles that is going to um, serve both our elderly and disabled population, our Medicaid transportation services, our job uh, recovery access program, as well as what you're calling the mobility for all program to help not only support um, businesses who need workers, but people who need rides literally to get to work, to get to the doctors, to childcare and to food. That's what we are developing. I think you all uh, will know that we have a lot of unmet needs 
and particularly given our rural nature. How do we think differently to expand upon um, what we know are problems, whether it's the high vehicle miles traveled, um, our maintenance costs, um, and access? I want to just step for a minute to help you uh, understand why. Why is a community action agency, an anti-poverty organization, getting involved in transportation? Well, yes, it, I think, connects to my passion for transportation, but in this job, understanding the depth and breadth of challenges of low-income Vermonters has been quite revealing to me. And at the beginning of my service in this organization five years ago, I met with a lot of different partner organizations, whether they were housing, uh, affordable housing providers, whether they were the food bank, um, the community health centers, um, uh, the parent-child centers, all these different organizations we work with. And I asked them what their biggest challenges were. And it was often, if not always, transportation. Our folks are trapped in poverty or in disadvantaged situations without access. So that has really been a motivator for me. At the same time, uh, as you all are struggling with, we have the climate crisis impending. We have this goal to transition to all electric vehicles. And that's where this program fits in. I do want to mention the degree of challenges for folks who don't have access. I think um, you know this, this slide really shares uh, the challenge of isolation that many of our older Vermonters, uh, folks with disabilities, really have. Um, but we also really want to bring to your attention, as we've been thinking about this program and how do we make it happen, we met with lots of partners, including businesses. Um, we met with the um, head of human resources for the Central Vermont Hospital, who told us at that time, this is pre-COVID, they had 200 unfilled positions, most of which were for entry level. They were creating new positions to see who else they could attract and retain. When they surveyed the people who didn't take the job, number one problem, transportation. You all have businesses who can't fill their seats. Transportation is one of the reasons. And that's why we see this solution as something that leverages. We want to work with our businesses to help provide access. We want to um, make sure that our social services can utilize our system <coughs> to provide access for their folks, whether whatever their challenges are. Um, and what's the third one? Business and you, state government, our partner. Um, it has been a journey and I really appreciate Ross being in the room, uh, trying to help uh, support us and challenge us uh, along the way. But we are incredibly thrilled uh, that we now are um, grant recipients. We've signed a contract and we are in a 90 day period from signature to launch to begin uh, as a sub grant recipient to Green Mountain Transit Agency, who I believe you're gonna be talking to next, to launch this service. We're starting small. We're starting with, I believe, four vehicles. Um, we are going to be like an Uber system. We're going to use the technology available to help get more um, efficient rides to our customers. Right from the start, our customers, customers will be the elderly and disabled, uh, Medicaid transportation, those subsidized rides that you already support through your transit agencies. We are going to be working as a partner to our transportation, our transit agency. But our goal is to build up from there. I'm going to pass it to um, to scale up, to expand to many other markets, so that this is a leverage federal dollars, adding in other private sector dollars, businesses to expand this effort. Does that make sense? All right, sure. Um, so Paul Zabriskie, uh, Capstone Weatherization and Climate Impact Director. Um, so I, I just want to provide an overview of what's the business plan, because that's really the process we've been in. Um, our, our goal was to launch with as low risk as possible. And, and so working with 
Green Mountain Transit and some government grants, what we know is that every mile that we drive is paid for, for the cost of that car, that driver, that uh, overhead directly related to that. So, so when we acquire cars and we acquired our first car beginning of this week, um, uh, every mile we drive, we're paying for. The administrative costs, Capstone has been supporting that. We've had some grants from V-Light and the Vermont Community Foundation, and we're working with a number of uh, philanthropists to help us cover those administrative costs to really get us up a growth curve. So uh, deploying the technology uh, in the vehicles and uh, subscribing to the, the new software service QRide, the state has contracted with, we'll get an incidence of that for ourselves um, that will allow us to talk with the state system, but also uh, provide services that go beyond sort of the limits of what the, the federal money can do. Um, so, so launching um, at a small scale with this sort of foundation of paid for services, and then laying on top of that, uh, the broader services, subscribing with businesses and, and getting folks to jobs, both through some publicly paid for and some privately paid for, paid for by the businesses and the employees. Um, expanding to the ability to provide on demand for all people. If you can afford to pay for that ride, we'll, we'd like to provide that ride for you and you can help support that critical mass. And really what we're trying to do is get to a scale where the administrative costs can be absorbed by the operations. And uh, right now, you know, because we're operating electric vehicles, you know, from day one, we're decarbonizing the state's transportation by in elderly and, and uh, disabled and, and those Medicare rides that we provide. Um, and we'll continue to work to look at where are opportunities where miles are being paid for and driven today that we can convert to electric miles and, and uh, with our contracts on renewables, essentially zero out those emission costs. Um, the goal is to be at 30 cars in 30 months. So it's quite ambitious, uh, but we feel that if we can get to 30 cars um, and develop the systems to manage 30 cars in motion, um, we project that that's probably 80 different individuals driving um, in terms of the workforce handling that fleet. Uh, at that scale, the systems can then really start to scale. You can go to 100, you can go to 1,000. And obviously, we're not just talking about Barry and Montpelier here. The, the issues that we've outlined exist throughout the state, right? So we are we're eager to work with uh, Lamoille County and delighted that they're launching a uh, micro transit service within the community of uh, Morristown. Um, but all those surrounding communities have lots of people who have needs. So, so the, the, the model is to sort of prove out uh, and, and, you know, learn as much as we can, as fast as we can uh, within our communities of Barry and the greater Barry Montpelier area, um, but rapidly take that to a scale where it's working for all Vermonters. Do you want to do any of this? Uh, sure, I'll speak a little bit to that. So um, with, with the original round of NTI funds, um, we did market research. We had a number of focus groups um, and really worked hard to hear the voices of the community that isn't being served. And, um, you know, we're, we had heard, you know, there's, I, I, you know, there's not a demand for that service. Well, there's not a demand for that service if we're not asking the right questions, right? That, um, and when we ask the questions, there's a huge demand uh, for folks who either don't have a license, can't afford a car. Um, you know, we have a situation in Vermont where because we use salt, we're very unlike other parts of rural America where you have 20 and 30 year old sort of beater cars that, that um, are 
more accessible. Here we have an inspection standard um, necessarily because our cars rot and they become dangerous after whatever, you know, 10, 12, 15 years, depends on the make and model. But uh, we get to that point where steering and brake lines and, and just, you know, underbody rot, the car's done. And uh, so we necessarily have to be on top of that, but it's very expensive. Um, and that, you know, the number that's tossed around is nominally $10,000 a year that a household needs to be putting into a car. And uh, so our goal is to try and help folks who don't want to own cars get where they need to go. And they can contribute some to that. And there will always be a group of people who will need subsidy. We recognize that. But there's others who are sort of in a gray area. And, and we'd like to try and find ways to braid together the various resources. Um, uh, sort of lost my place there. That's fine. Vision. Well, I want to just explain um, where we're going. I think you've heard, but the thing I don't think we've explained um, is what is Community Rides Vermont? You understand that Capstone Community Action is a, a nonprofit organization, been here for a long time. We are incubating Community Rides Vermont, um, and a separate nonprofit organization with uh, here is our board of directors, some of the names you may recognize, as well as a project team. Um, and really, once we launch this, it will become a project of Community Rides Vermont. And the reason for that is we know that we need a specialization, uh, a, spe a board who have better connection to this program and this concept than our capstone um, board of directors, but also significantly, it is important to have, I think, a, an infrastructure and an institutional arrangement where we can blend the publicly funded rides with new opportunities from business, potentially other federal programs that otherwise wouldn't be utilized, as well as uh, philanthropy and the private marketplace. So it is that leveraging of different funding sources that I think is what's so key for you all to understand about our effort. Um, and then there is our impact. Uh, we see this as such a multifaceted program and are excited that <clears throat> we're looking at the climate. We are transitioning uh, to the electric fleet. We're gonna learn lessons and our riders will learn lessons. Um, and of course, we're decarbonizing every current ride that we may be displacing. Uh, we're looking, as we said, for access to employment. Not only are there empty positions, there are people looking for work, and we want to make those connections. Um, we really want to make sure we are addressing uh, those needs of isolated Vermonters, Vermonters without access. And I will just say, you know, one of the many programs that Capstones run is a program for pregnant and parenting teens, young women who have carried their babies to term and choose uh, and have to drop out of high school. Uh, we run Head Start. So we have the opportunity not only to care for their kiddos when they're born, but to support them in their getting their actual high school diploma and moving on to post-secondary education. So we have this program. We have a student who cannot get to us without a car. Imagine that we can't get to your high school without a car. I met with our Head Start home visitors about a month ago. Uh, those are folks who go into the homes of very low-income people, moms uh, with very little kids. And they, I was just saying, what are your challenges? I wanted to hear about their challenges of their work. Every one of them said, our families can't get to the doctor. We can't give them the rides and they can't get the rides. So this is an issue that is just so prevalent and so important. And we hope, we want to thank you for A, laying the groundwork. Um, we do hope that you continue to support and grow the MTI program. I honestly don't know that much about where what the governor's recommend is, but we want you to be robust in that investment, recognize the opportunities ahead, as well as um, the mobility for all 
which I think right now is within that program. But that's enabling us to really think about beyond who is a vulnerable Vermonter. It isn't just someone elderly or with, with disabilities that can't get to the doctor. It's many, many low-income people. So with that, we just thank you for your time, uh, your interest. Did you have more you wanted to say well, before I, we close? Uh, I'm sort of curious if there's questions and, and absolutely if you want to have this is I was saying thank you for coming in this is really innovative we heard a little bit of a preview from Ross uh, talking a little bit about rural Uber when um, when he was giving his overview of his uh, of his of his but the public transit budget so this is this is really exciting as somebody uh, who represents two rural communities and I know I mean it's we're we're within close proximity of Brattleboro but it's enough miles, like it's nine, 11 miles. It, it's really challenging for, for folks. So I'm really excited to, to hear more. So I wanna open up to questions from the committee. Sure, why not? Yeah. Hi, yeah. Sir. Uh, so just like a little background on, I think I heard you say that uh, you uh, about to enter a contract or a grant contract or something with Green Mountain Transit, just, just in the very near future to provide this some sort of service. I'm not sure what that's going to say or how it's going to work. And then uh, let's start with that. Correct. We have already signed a contract to be a sub-recipient to the Green Mountain Transit to provide the elderly and disabled rides that they are contracted to provide, as well as the Medicaid transportation and the job recovery access program as well as this new uh, opportunity with mobility for all. So the agency contracts uh, with uh, Green Mountain Transit, and I'm looking to Ross to make sure I've got this, and then we are a sub-recipient. So we are absolutely partnering with GMT uh, to see how we can innovate this. So maybe we can get to uh, customers that they can't with an all-electric vehicle. Um, we know that it's um, cost competitive with what it would cost them to take that ride, often with a much larger vehicle, of course, diesel vehicle. So um, we are very much in a learning stage, and this is the incredible opportunity to begin our program on a very small scale this spring. So right now, your program's conceptual. Yes. Uh, no pilot. You have not run a pilot program to see, to get any data on what you may or may not be facing yet? I would consider this opportunity as the pilot. Okay, that's fair. Uh, <clears throat> but we did do a lot of transportation planning through the MTI grants, um, all of which has been reviewed both by the agency and GMT. Uh, we've been working with them for probably over a year on this. It's not just sort of a, a, a out of the box new idea. It is innovative, but it's been uh, reviewed and it's going to be very carefully uh, reviewed as, a, as we launch. So this obviously differs, differs from the My Right program pilots that are running around the state. Uh, and there's, I guess there's one in Montpelier that's still going on. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing yours is yours an on-call demand for service. So I, I think um, the word pilot may be uh, I think it has connotations in the context of these federal dollars that are not germane to us, all right? We contract at an hourly rate for a ride given, a ride paid for. Um, and the, uh, the my understanding is some of the federal funding <laughs> provides a three-year window to figure out, is this, is this the right thing? Um, we're not part of that process from our perspective, it may be from Ross's perspective, but, but from our perspective, we're launching a business, right? And uh, we know that there's a lot we don't know, right? I wanna be humble about the, the fact that we are new to this environment. Um, I, unfortunately, our general manager, Chris Cole is not here today, but a wealth of experience in this industry. Amanda, who was uh, with me last time I was in is also uh, away getting some much needed vacation before we launch. Um, so she's not here. Those are the two people who could speak most uh, clearly about our specific structure. Um, but we're... So you're contracting, you're, you're contracting to provide rides to somebody that needs a ride and they'll contact you in some way. 
And yes, under that contract, those rides are going to be um, managed through the call center and meet all of the current uh, systems that GMT has. I think I heard Paul you say that it's on a per ride basis. Uh, your contract with GMT is on a per ride basis. It's actually an hour. It's an hourly per contract. So I. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I, I know it's I know it's an hourly contract. I, how what those windows are? We're dispatched by Green Mountain Transit okay. in the in the E and D, the non emergency medical transport piece of this. I'm trying to figure out how this is all going to work. Uh, service area. So I think I heard you say probably a whole area that Capstone covers. At the outset, we're really just focused on sort of the greater Barry area. You mentioned the My Ride, and again, I think that would be great for to hear from Ross. Um, we are working to complement every existing system. We are not trying to undermine or, or you know compete. We're trying to complement and extend the reach of our existing, you know, primarily fixed route, but now new ride hailing opportunities with new innovative ways to try to meet this mixed demand, as well as to get different funding sources so that it's not all public sector supported. And, and startup capital, uh, we had to garner some startup capital. So we are using a combination of bank loans. Our primary capital cost is cars and Fortunately, the financial world is very comfortable financing cars. <laughs> um, so that piece of it. And then uh, the, the other startup costs have been carried by grants, by Capstone, uh, and by philanthropists. I think. I do want to we're, mention. We're, we're, not, we're not using state capital grants to purchase vehicles. That allows us to use those vehicles much more flexibly than the the existing transit operators can use their equipment. And that I think is one of the major differentiations that, that why what we're trying to do can't necessarily be done by Green Mountain Transit because they're working under a range of constraints. So by us being just an hourly contractor to them, we can provide uh, clean rides for their customers at a lower rate than they can provide it because our cost structure is uh, overall lower. We're not trying to do as many things as they're trying to do. Um, so we're we're a contractor and it allows us to then use those same vehicles to provide rides to people who are paying for them. I want to add one other thing because you're right about startup costs and we are in a major capital fundraising campaign uh, to build that up so that we can scale up even as we launch with a small fleet focused primarily on this relationship uh, with Green Mountain Transit. We did receive a, um, a congressionally directed expenditure uh, from, <laughs> yep, I just wanted to get it, I think accurate, um, from now Senator Welch. And that will help us with our physical space. Right now, Capstone is going to host in our garage um, uh, the first four vehicles uh, as we begin this spring. But we do have uh, a federal investment in capital for a uh, garage, which will have um, solar, I'm sorry, um, the electric chargers. It will have a facility where we can wash and clean the cars as well as have an office. And we imagine that somewhere maybe on the Barry Montpelier Road close to the city of Barry. We'd like it to be in as close to a downtown as possible. And then my final question is, I think uh, your, your know, LLC or whatever corporate, corporate structure you use to set up is uh, based on not necessarily a profitable business, but a, but a, a business model that fits in uh, into your scope as Capstone uh, without uh, additional funding. That's our goal. Yeah, well, we, we do envision con continuing with the public support for those publicly subsidized rides. Um, we believe uh, that we may find social impact investors to invest in this concept. 
Uh, we believe there are philanthropists who want to, whether they are folks interested in uh, social and economic justice or whether they're interested in the climate, uh, they may help us with this launch. We are a nonprofit structure. Um, and anything that we may receive that goes beyond our um, costs, we would plow back into this program to expand its opportunity for providing rides for those that can't. Thank you. Great. So I, I know there's some, I, I wanna, <clears throat> I wanted to just ask a question. I know we have a couple other questions. Um, the, your, the goal is to be at 30 cars in 30 months. Which is That's our ambition, ambitious, ambitious aspiration. <laughs> I love that. And um, and so, it, I, and I understand that Barry is like kind of the, your first area. Are you, with that expansion, are you thinking about other geographic areas of the state? Or is, I know that Capstone has a geographic footprint, right? Correct. And so with, with Community Rides Vermont, is the intention to also work with other public transit providers in other parts of the state to do this kind of extension of their of their access to rides is that the concept with the yes the, we'll be working with the same software mm -hmm. right and ultimately this is an it business yeah. <laughs> it's an it's a marketing business it's an it business and it you know the product is rides but but what makes it all go is efficiently deploying that and that's that's about software and, and but it's also about vehicles and drivers and other parts yeah. of the state too so i guess that's what my our vision is absolutely to see if we can demonstrate success in this model so that other areas around the state other transit provider other uh interests uh interested parties can consider it for their area absolutely it's our vision we're going to start small sure. we're going to get started in our area but if we can demonstrate success and opportunity this is this is our hope and so just so that i'm we clear have other hopes oh, have hopes of of building a, a connection with rideshare vermont um, you know, part of the vision is can we help vermonters who want to live either without a car or with one car instead of two do that you know that's part of the vision the the larger vision and, and where my question is coming from, you, your capstone has really great capacity and, and leadership. And so um, thinking about if your vision is that with Community, community Rides Vermont, if it could kind of not just be a model that could be replicated, which is often how we think about things in Vermont, but if it could help grow that capacity around the state. Is that, is that, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the, the, the vision. So the demand is universal. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, oh, I mean, so, the committee knows that. I think yeah. uh, those of us. I think our others. our vision is that the operations is decentralized, right? That that the the most efficient ride is is departing uh, from as close to the departure point as possible and returning. You know, so so it's uh, administration. You want to centralize. You want to get the data. You want to have the tech people. Um, working together and supporting all of the operations, but operations happens in small nodes, not big headquarters and, and centralized service hubs. And I think we will be demonstrating, you know, is this nonprofit the right model? Mm -hmm. Could there be better partners? Um, could it be run right out of the the existing uh, transit providers. We we worry that there are li such limitations to that that it may not work, but we don't know that. And I think for sure, every member of our board of directors vision is that this is much bigger <laughs> than Barry Vermont. Great. Okay, I know there are other questions. Thank you for that. I think Representative Burke. Yeah, I just want to say this is so exciting. And it's such a great it's an extension of your career Sue, <laughs> in the transportation world. And Paul, I know how much work you've done uh, in this, and setting up the Mile Smart Program, for example. I mean, you're, you have been innovators, and it's really inspiring. So you received an MTI grant for planning. What was yeah? Yes, we uh, applied for and received in the first two rounds uh, two different planning grants. One was really a needs assessment, and the second one was much more about software and technology and uh and the third round we were not notified that it was uh -huh. available but you, you foresee sort of going back there periodically 
to. I think we could make great use of some of the opportunities for innovative answering key questions that may not be solvable within our confines. Yes, and I think the MTI program right now, especially as I understand it, Ross can clarify, the mobility for all element uh, is very important to some of what we're trying to achieve. So our hope is that that has robust investment that can expand. The other questions, Representative Pouch and then Representative Lally. Thank you. So uh, you take over, you contract out to do the subsidized rides that are already existing. So that helps bring in some funds. Then you're going to uh, uh, backfill or add more rides. And these would be no cost rides and rides that people would pay for. How do you make those distinct distinctions? And, uh, you know, within the, if I call and say, I need a ride, how do you make that distinction? Whether you just give the ride, appropriately so, even though it's not subsidized through the, <coughs> the programs and or, you know, cost of the ride. I, I'll try to the best of my yeah. knowledge here. Um, uh, so the goal is to Braid funding streams. So, so it may be that we're putting more than one person in a car, yeah. um, and there's a lot of efficiencies gained in that. Um, and different people may be paid for by different funding streams, um, and everybody may be paying a different rate for that ride. Right? This is the, the, I don't like to use the air airline model, but it's it's one we yeah. experienced. Um, so uh, the goal would be that, that everybody who gets in a car is a member of some form. You're, you're pre-registered. We're not a taxi, right? Yeah. We're not just see you go wave from the side road and pull over. That's not. So uh, everybody is registered in the system and that CRM system is capable of identifying what services that particular client is eligible for. And it may be that there's different programs in play at different <coughs> times of the day. And uh, one of the challenges is that existing transit has a window of operations that doesn't necessarily meet the needs of people who need to get to work very early or who work into the evening um, or who are trying to get to church. Or So, um, we're, we're trying to sort of fill in in those gaps and use the available funding streams that we can. And sometimes that'll be paying full retail and sometimes it'll be paying some percentage of that. And, and I wanna add just other opportunities that we're thinking about. We've told you about businesses with whom we've had deep conversations, darn tough, needing uh, folks from Barry to get to Waterbury now, um, Vermont Creamery, the hospital, but an even larger opportunity could exist with One Care Vermont, depending on its future. Uh, I was just at a national conference with other community action agencies around the country, many of whom are trying to address the same problem because it exists everywhere and have, no, have found that um, you know, every state has its own construct for healthcare spending. But the MCOs, the, they're getting paid to uh, not provide rides as we're doing, but to pay for Uber and Lyft, which exists in other places yeah. uh, at a scale that's affordable. So I believe that um, there may be well <coughs> many other ways of us potentially getting support for medical transportation than the existing ones, depending on a lot of factors. But it is an area of exploration because it's critical, very, very critical. Okay. Madam Chair, I just want to get in line to ask a question. Okay, also. we have we have a, we have testimony. We can thank you, uh, Representative Campbell, Representative Lally, and <coughs> Representative, Campbell, and, and we need to wrap wrap it up. I think so. so we have testimony. I, I just wanted to say I think this coordinates beautifully with a lot of the uh, discussions about housing and repopulating uh, our historic settlement pattern. Um, it's kind of restoring uh, at a scale that complements the the. the what those settings provide and what life is like in there. Um, and it also helps to uh, revitalize them as centers, you know, regionalized, decentralized centers. So I think this is very exciting. 
Thank you. And we haven't had a chance to meet yet, but you probably wouldn't know that I spent 10 years in the Department of, of Housing doing the downtown revitalization program. So you're right. <laughs> we are thinking about all of that. Representative Campbell, who's joining us. On yes, thank you. Sorry I couldn't be there today, uh, Sue and Paul. I'm, I'm homesick, almost better, but not quite. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether you've engaged any, uh, any people who've worked with or for <laughs> Uber or Lyft in, in, uh, in getting their uh, sort of uh, system designed. Uh, have we engaged with what we, we have paid a local driver um, to sit down and consult with us about- <laughs> A Lyft driver, a Uber Lyft, and Lyft. Uh, to, to sort of talk about his experience operating in the broader Barry Montpelier area. So I would I would consider that sort of commercial intelligence. Um, uh, I, I want to mention also uh, on this team, John McBride uh, is a consultant who hasn't worked for Uber and Lyft, but has done work with sort of ride hailing and on demand services. He's sort of our, I guess, so-called expert in that area. Yeah. Uh, he worked with Bridge, which was formed out of Middlebury College years ago, uh, helping students get uh, to and from uh, the, the school. Um, anyway. Great. Well, thanks. Um, this is a very exciting thing you're getting underway, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear about it. And I, I'm sure you've got uh, various... Um, scenarios um, sort of mapped out depending on how, how things go in terms of uh, the level of public support for these rides uh, versus um, you know, what you're gonna have to charge and, and, and how much of it's gonna be supported by fares. Yeah, we're, um, thank you. Uh, you know, we're watchful of the conversation about fare-free transit. It, it doesn't necessarily help our model um uh in at least in the Barry Montpelier area and and I'm not really informed about it at the level obviously that you folks have been having this debate um I think it's a completely different creature in the communities where fixed bus service has been a success but uh it, it's we're we have a, a hard time figuring out how to integrate this with uh the services we're trying to provide um, I just sort of in summary, I want to both talk a little bit about this with the mileage smart program, but also community rides. You know, the, the data that came out of rural Wisconsin, um, I find really compelling. And that, that was that when it comes to a household that's on public assistance, access to a car and a driver's license is a better indicator of their ability to get off that public assistance than a high school diploma. Right. It, it, is, it is so fundamental to helping people get out of uh, a grind. Um, and we're really excited to, to be pushing for new ways to make that work. Okay. Any last questions? Well, this is great. Thank you for coming in. And, thank you for giving uh, us. And thank you for your work. I mean, it's really, it's the, the integrated approach that you're taking to this. Um, I know lots of, several of us are represent rural communities and we, I know transportation is a huge barrier for people, not just to participate in work or get to doctor's appointments. And this was, you know, we heard this from the, I think it was the EAN report, you know, just about participating in community life. You know, you hear about families who want to take their kids to the movies, like things that some basic things that those of us with our own automobiles take for granted. So I think this is, you know, it's a really interesting model and it's really exciting to get, it's really, really wonderful to hear a fuller report. So glad that those MTI grants incubated some good ideas. So thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. You're welcome to stay. Thanks to our partners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have yet to meet in person. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of for, is that is wonderful how that uh, worked out. Uh, so wonderful. Well, um, thanks to all of you. Keep up your good, important work. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sue. So you're welcome to stay in our little, you know, in your old committee room, <laughs> of course. So we're going to transition now. Um, we've invited uh, uh, Clayton Cart uh, and Nicholas Foss of Green Mountain Transit to come in and uh, keep, um, to talk more detail about um, uh, a request that they have. So 
Um, why don't we transition? For Jeannie? Right. Jeannie's not here, so I think I'm gonna. We're, we've ignited. Uh, <laughs> Are you? Are you Good morning, everybody. Right. Disconnect right now. I take it. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just pass it there. Okay. Fair, I, I have two left. I don't know if anybody on that end requests the paper. Uh, it's in our packet, right? So, yeah. so you're all set. Thank you, Leonora. So as we get settled in, I want to make sure that, oh, good. You have figured out our, our toggle down there. <laughs> That's great. So we have a couple of people. So I think we have two chairs. Terrific. You just write it. So welcome back to the committee, Clayton. And if, um, uh, well, happy to have you here. Um, we have until about 1030 this morning to hear from you. So and great that you have your presentation is up for folks who might be watching on YouTube. I believe, did you send this to our committee assistant? I'm just looking to see. Yeah, sorry, it just got completed okay. <laughs> last night, so. That's okay, if you, if you could, um, following me, if you could just send it to Jeannie Lowell, our committee assistant, we'll, she'll be able to post this on our committee page. Um, Oh, great. Well, welcome to the committee. Um, and if you could just start off by ident identifying yourself for the record. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. So I'm Clay Clark. I'm the general manager of Green Mountain Transit. Nick Foss. I'm the uh, director of finance. Well, welcome. Welcome back. And so I'm going to do a, a brief uh, introduction before turning things over uh, to Nick. Um, uh, during the, the last time we talked about uh, Zero Fare briefly last week, um, we talked a little bit about GMT's finances, and I thought that it would make sense to start with that. And so Nick is going to give you all a, um, uh, a presentation that will let you know where we're at now and where we're headed and, where, and why we're having concerns. Um, I do want to say that uh, um, I want to acknowledge Ross's presence and, and thank him and VTrans. Uh, VTrans is... Uh, simultaneously our biggest champion and, and our taskmasters, you know, depending on uh, the conversation or even a portion of the conversation. And, uh, you know, we're going to present a, an alternative uh, recommendation from VTrans, but that's, you know, we're, we're, we're having a disagreement among friends and we're not looking to, you know, upset the apple cart there with them. And um, uh, one of the things that I want to uh, uh, let you all know is uh, before Nick starts is how lean GMT is. I have never been in an organization that is is administratively lean. And, and what I mean by that is that we have 180 employees. We have zero clerks, zero receptionists, zero administrative assistants, zero, you know, this is an organization that really runs bare bones. And uh, I want you to keep that in mind uh, when you hear about uh, our financial position and our uh, uh, economic outlook, because I want you to understand that, you know, the fat has long been cut at GMT and uh, the cuts have dug, you know, into the bone. And, uh, and so I just want you to be aware of that uh, during the presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Nick, and he's going to walk us through where we're at. Well, thank you all for taking the time and letting us come in here. I've, um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, a couple things. Uh, so the organizational overview, I'll try to smooth through that. I think you all have a good sense of what Green Mountain Transit does, but I did want to just quickly do a review of that. Um, the funding summary, where does the money come in? What do we spend it on? Um, I think that would be helpful for you all to, to see. And then we'll end with the financial outlook. So I'll hopefully not try to depress you all um, too much through that. But um, so that, those are the, that's the plan for today. Um, so the organiza organizational overview, uh, GMT was chartered in 1973 um, as a municipal corporation. So we are a municipality uh, by the Vermont General Assembly. Um, and then in 2011, uh, we actually uh, uh, merged with Green Mountain Transit Agency, which is right in Washington County, Berlin. Um, and then in 2016, we actually rebranded GMTA as GMT. Um, we are governed by a 13 member board of commissioners. So Burlington gets two members, uh, the other towns, uh, South Burlington, Winooski, Essex, they all get one uh, commissioner. We meet monthly. Uh, we do have committees, finance, leadership, uh, and then operations committees uh, where we try to do all that good work. 
Um, and then the mission, uh, obviously, is to promote and operate safe, convenient, accessible, innovative, and sustainable public transportation services in Northwest and Central Vermont. Um, that reduces congestion and pollution, uh, encourages transit-oriented development, and enhances the quality of life for all. Um, how do we do that? So we have a number of ways we do that. We do that with our fixed route, which is both in-city and commuter. Demand response, uh, microtransit, which uh, some of <coughs> you are very familiar with, we started here in the Montpelier area. Uh, Medicaid, which um, we uh, do, uh, we have a contract through DIVA uh, that EBTA administers for us. And then our elderly and disabled program, which helps folks that are over the age of 65, I believe, Ross. Okay. And then, uh, or if you have a disability, you can get demand response uh, trips to both uh, um, social or doctor's visits. Um, we uh, recently started the job access and recovery uh, for folks that are in recovery that need uh, transportation to jobs. And then uh, we all also have an ADA uh, that. By law, we have to provide uh, uh, transportation to folks uh, that uh, qualify for the ADA program. Um, we actually do not provide that service, but we contract with uh, Special Services Transportation Agency in Colchester. Um, partners, uh, we can't do this alone. Uh, so we have many partners, uh, CIDR, which is in the Grand Isle area, uh, SSTA, as I just spoke of, and then um, we have volunteer drivers, uh, which do a lot of our demand response program trips. And then Community Rides Vermont is our, our newest uh, partner, which I'm sure you uh, well, was just here a minute ago speaking. So, uh, so now into the funding summary. Um, so this is our budget. I hope you can all see this. Oh, great. And so, uh, you know, as you can see, uh, GMT is broken out into both urban services and rural. Uh, urban services are in Chittenden County, um, which primarily is fixed route. Uh, that's where ADA also comes into play, but also on the rural area as well. And then um, on the rural side, it's uh, Washington, Franklin, Grand Isle area, uh, where we provide services with many partners such as CIDR. Um, we're gonna focus on the urban uh, area. So we uh, essentially have to keep two sets of books because of the money, uh, the way the money flows in. Um, on the urban side, the money comes uh, from VTrans. Uh, a lot of money comes from VTrans. And then some also directly to us straight from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, on the rural side, uh, almost all the money flows in uh, directly from VTrans. Uh, so it is very different. Today, we're gonna just focus on, focus on the urban side because that's where we're, ta we're talking about fares. Um, but as you can see, that's about a $17.7 million uh, operation currently. Um, so what are the sources? So every dollar uh, that comes in uh, to GMT, uh, and this is based on FY24. So this might you know, change year to year a little bit, but it stays fairly consistent. Um, over the last couple of years, the federal portion has grown considerably because of the COVID relief funds that have flown in. Uh, but uh, you, know, you can see about 20 cents on the dollar uh, that comes in is from the, from the local <coughs> members. That's Burlington, South Burlington, Winooski, all of those member communities on the urban side. Uh, the state, uh, about 13 cents of, our, 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 of the money that comes in is straight state operating funds. Um, the federal, uh, obviously the largest portion is about 54 cents. And then 12 cents from fares is what we're planning on in FY24. Uh, and then about a, a penny uh, comes in and that's mostly made up of things like advertising uh, revenue and, thing, and, and revenues of that nature. Um, this is just the same exact thing, only it's the nominal amount. So you can see the federal portion in FY24. Uh, we're budgeting to spend about $9.6 million in federal funds. Uh, that'll be primarily uh, federal formula funds that require uh, a, a non-federal match, uh, but there are some COVID relief funds, a small portion in there as well. Um, you're seeing we get a, a, a great deal of money from the state, so $2.3 million. Um, 3.6 roughly is, is coming from the local uh, members. And then operating revenue is about 165,000, and, and we're pre uh, planning on about a little over two million dollars coming in from fares in FY24. The operating cost structure. Um, so, what do we spend our money on? Uh, you'll see a, a great deal of it. Over 60 cents uh, on every dollar is spent on salary and benefits. Um, the remainder uh, is about uh, mainly maintenance, uh, which is the third largest, about 15 cents. Uh, and then the remaining is, is, is planning and marketing and then general and admin and kind of going back to Clayton's uh, take on how lean we are, uh, you know, general and admin. I mean, that doesn't include wages, I want to be very clear, but um, other administrative expenses are, are, are fairly low. So now we'll get into the fun part. Uh, so the, the financial outlook. Um, so 
first thing is, you know, GMT is, is definitely approaching a financial cliff, and I'll uh, get into the reasons why in, in, in the next couple of slides. Um, but we are definitely not alone. Um, this is a, a universal, uh, it seems, uh, industry-wide um, problem. Uh, it, you know, COVID relief funds came in. They certainly propped up the system for quite a long time. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with the same challenges uh, uh, in an inflationary environment and federal and, and other funding that is not growing at the same rate as our expenses are growing. So there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, this chart uh, shows essentially uh, our operating expenses. Um, you can see they certainly have been elevated since FY21. Uh, a couple of reasons for that obviously is, is just inflation in general. And then you know fuel prices have certainly gone up quite a lot um, over the last couple of years. And then uh, the, the purple uh, chart or the purple line is, is fares. And you can see that that's for the most part stayed fairly level. Um, and they haven't grown. Uh, and we're expecting to collect less fares uh, in FY24 uh, than we did uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and the green line, green line shows essentially our fare box recovery rate. So you can see back in FY12, FY13, we were able to pay for about 18 to 22% of our operating expenses just with fares. Um, we're expecting to pay or be able to pay about 11% of our operating expenses in FY24, which is uh, definitely a challenge. And, why other funds have to be identified to pay for that. And that primarily is federal funds. And when you have federal funds coming in to offset that, you're also are gonna need non-federal match, which is also, a, a, we're running into a shortage in which will be a, a great challenge in the next couple of coming years. Do you mind, um, Nicholas, if I just ask you to go back to that sure. slide before, just to make sure we're all understanding the, the, the purple line, which is the fares, sure. and the projection. Um, Cause you said in FY24, you're, it, can you unpack that a little bit? Yes. Yeah. So this is just a history of fares. So we've, you know, back in FY12, FY13, we were collecting, I think at the height, we got up to about $2.4 million in fares. Um, because ridership is down um, and fares have not really grown for many, many years, um, you know, we're expecting to collect a lot less fares than we did, um, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, I think we have about 1.9 or, or sorry, about $2 million in, in fares that we're projecting to be able to collect in FY24. Um, likely if we, you know, we are looking to re-implement uh, a new fare system, one where people can use credit cards and things of that nature, which will be great for, you know, the rider. However, there are costs to that, right? So um, our credit card transaction costs are gonna grow quite a bit. So we're expecting the net fare amount to be a little bit lower. So the zero fare though, that's that, that because we had zero fare, you didn't collect fare. Exactly, that's why that was 0% for those periods of time. And so with this projection going from FY23 to FY24, that's that you're building into this model that you're gonna be collecting. Yes, some, some so in FY24, our budget was passed with fares, about $2 million, and that's what we expect to, to collect. Okay, so we have another question, yeah, Representative Lally. I just, I just wanna drill down for a second. So it sounds like the biggest driver is the the reduced ridership is is that's the key to the whole thing so that's part of it uh, for sure and that's what really is um we're a little bit fortunate because there's some transit agencies you know when you get into agencies that have a rail and, and things like that they're even more uh you know dependent on fares and so when you have less ridership you know your costs are fixed for the most part um so you're taking in less fares you got to identify other sources of funds to fill that hole, um, which the COVID relief funds, you know, really filled that over the years, but, but those are- The problem at the moment is we came out of COVID and uh, we were propped up with federal funds. Mm -hmm. and now we have a situation where we have reduced ridership. So even if we were to reinstitute institute fares, we would still have reduced ridership. So the key, the core problem is how do you expand ridership? Yes, correct. Uh, expand ridership, but also um, really the goal should be to have fair box recovery rates that don't fall, you know, 50%. Um, and I don't know if there's enough ridership to really gain. I think, you know, there's going to have to be some serious considerations of other revenue sources identified or higher fares. Um, so that's something the board is going to have to discuss certainly in the, in the coming years. Have fares stayed flat? Like what is, the, have they stayed, like what, how? I have not raised since I came and I've been with GMT for about four years, I think. So the, rate, the fares. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure. I think there was, fair, Ross probably honestly knows. Uh, do you remember the last time? Before you started, uh, there was yeah. a, a reset of fares uh, when Phil was on the 
you know, board of commissioners and uh, certainly just looking at, you know, the increased costs are a big Well, and that's the other thing I wanted to get into, too, is that it, the costs have grown, and that's also, you know, a big major reason the, the fair box recovery rates have fallen. Um, you know, we are a unionized workforce, uh, and every year there's going to be increases in salaries and wages. Our benefits are very rich at GMT. Um, we certainly provide very good benefit plans. Um, and I just want to point out, and FY24 will be the last year before we enter a new CBA. So my expectation is costs are, are going to grow. Hopefully we'll be able to, you know, bring that slope down a little bit. But, um, uh, you know, that's, that's certainly going to be a challenge. I know we'll have questions. I want to let you go through your sure. <laughs> I, I only have a couple more. So that's fine. I just, be some time left. Fair line, I was just interested. Sure. Thank you so much. So, uh, and then number two, you know, COVID relief funds are drying up. As you can see, uh, what this chart shows is the money that flew in and then the balances that we had going into each fiscal year. So you can see FY20 and FY21, we were flush. At one point we had, you know, close to $12 million in COVID relief funds, uh, but we certainly spent those um, and they are falling. And really we saw this cliff coming. And so, uh, you know, the FTA was, very um, forward about saying, hey, listen, don't you know, hoard these funds. We want you to spend them. Um, so we took that approach with CARES and CRISA, and then we saw the cliff coming, um, and, and, and there was a little bit more flexibility with the ARPA funds in terms of how, how long you can hold on to those. So really what we're doing now is we're only plugging ARPA funds into our budget to fill the, the hole of non-federal funds. So, uh, and that I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation, but you know, if we didn't have COVID relief funds right now available to us, we wouldn't have enough non-federal match to really leverage all the federal funds we have. So I just want to be very clear about that. So at the end of FY24, we project to have about $1.9 million in COVID relief funds, and which we, we will use in future fiscal years to bridge that gap between the, the shortage of non-federal match that we have. Can you use the Medicaid dollars like for it to match? It's on the rural side. Okay. So, so it's yeah, it's totally separate. separate. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, so it's not just non-federal match that is a shortage too, it's, it's federal funds. Um, we're spending a lot of federal funds now, um, you know, going back to that uh, FAERS chart, a big reason for that is because FAERS is covering, covering a, a much smaller portion of the budget now. So that, those, that budget has, or those revenues need to be made up somewhere else. And what we're doing is we're spending federal funds to fill the hole. So what this chart shows is in FY24, we're projecting to spend $5.2 million roughly of federal funds. Um, if you look at the bottom, that's our 5307 uh, projected allocations over the next couple of years. 5307 is, it funds about 30% of the urban uh, revenues. It comes directly to us um, from the FTA. It's based on two things. 50% of it is based on population. So that doesn't change very much. You know, we know what we're gonna get for that. Um, the other 50% is made up of stick factors, um, which are performance-based. Um, so it really measures how efficient are you running your transit agency. And so you get extra money based on that. The next slide, I'll get into that a little bit more, but really what I'm trying to show here is we're spending $888,000 over what the federal money that's coming in um, in, our, in the FY24 budget. And we're able to do that because during COVID, we were getting that COVID money and we were also getting the regular formula money. So we were able to bank the, the, those years of formula funds. So we're able to run a deficit right now, but eventually we're gonna run out of federal funds too. So, um, you know, it's not just a non-federal uh, fund issue, it's a federal fund issue as well. <clears throat> um, and then non-federal funds, I just wanna show, you know, this is just an example of, you know, kind of how we plugged in the, 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 the COVID money to fill the, the gap in local funds that we have. So, you know, in, in FY24, the non-federal funds that we have budgeted were six point, say $4 million roughly, right? Well, we really needed about 6.7 million to leverage all of the federal funds that we were drawing down. So what did we do? We plugged that in with COVID funds. So we, we uh, had to plug in about $350,000 of COVID funds because we were short on non-federal funds. Now, if we didn't have those COVID funds, we would have had to have raised non-federal match in other ways if we did it through our local assessments with our partners like Burlington and South Burlington, their assessments would have had to go up about 10%. And just so you know, we've raised assessments on average three to 4% a year over the history that I can remember at GMT. 
Um, if we didn't, if they would have turned that down, we would have had to done two things, go to Ross and Ross might not have the capacity in his budget to support that. Um, if that was the case, we'd have to cut service. So. And then the last slide uh, is where, you know, I think if we got bridge funding to, you know, implement a new fare system, it, it isn't just going to uh, help the authority financially, but it, it would be a good investment, on, in my opinion, um, from the state. Uh, as I talked about 5307, half of it is population based, half of it is performance based. Um, as you can see down below, these are the stick factors. So these are the factors. If we meet them, we get extra money, right? So right now, GMT is meeting four of the stick factors out of the six um, that we uh, apply for each year. Um, four of the factors are based on ridership. Um, we are meeting two of those right now. Uh, the other two, we are very, very close at. So those are the ones on the left-hand side. So it's the passenger miles per vehicle revenue mile and the passenger miles per vehicle revenue hour. Um, I believe if we have the time to implement a new fare system, uh, which in, I think by January we could, we could do that, you know, we can minimize hopefully the loss of ridership um, that we would have uh, and hopefully get those other two stick factors. That's $1.1 million of extra federal funds that come in. And at least that solves the deficit of federal funds that we're having right now. In fact, it's 300,000 or 200,000 over um, the deficit. And maybe that's, you know, we can tell Ross, we don't need as much preventive maintenance money or, or whatnot. So that might be a benefit to, to VTrans as well. Um, but, you know, my, my worry is if we don't get this bridge funding, we're gonna be forced to use our COVID relief funds to fill that hole. We have about $1.9 million there. So that's really going to push that cliff much, you know, not to a year, you know, couple of years problem to like a next year problem possibly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, the other other choice we can make is just to get fares up and running as soon as possible, say September. And, you know, I, I don't really believe that will be a very successful operation and it could worsen ridership to the point where we lose the other the two six factors that we're getting and just make the federal funds deficit problem worse so um so i i do think that you know if, if we do get the bridge funding um you know hopefully uh that will um, allow us to minimize the disruption on our riders and, and help the financial uh, situation at, at gmt so um, that's all I have. Uh, happy to answer any questions. And uh, my contact info is there. If anybody has any questions about the presentation, I'll certainly uh, provide it. That'd be great. And, and maybe keep up that last slide if you don't sure. mind, because it might be helpful in the, some of some of the questions or, or discussions. Sure. I saw a few. I, saw I think if I, uh, I'm going to not uh, have nearly as much to go over as sure. it does, but there's some things that I think may touch upon people's questions. And, uh, and so really what I, uh, and not, uh, much of what I'll be talking about is, is in the handout. Um, the, the situation that GMT is in is that we know that to get a unified uh, fare box system, that we're gonna have to purchase about $650,000 worth of equipment. We're also gonna have to purchase uh, some additional software licenses that would be about an additional 160,000. But I'm not going to focus on that because those software licenses are instantaneous. You can just order them and they arrive quickly. Uh, not so with the fare boxes. And so I feel like we're in this position where we're being uh, asked to spend $650,000 on equipment that we don't even know if we're going to need. And it seems like a, a real um, irresponsible move to spend these taxpayer dollars if there is a general consensus that fare free should apply to all of Vermont and, and not just rural Vermont. So last year, the Board of uh, Commissioners uh, introduced a budget that uh, would be in, in, the, in uh, fiscal year 23. There was uh, interest from the legislature to extend zero fares, and that happened. This year, uh, the board passed a budget that would bring fares back in, in 24. Shortly after that budget was introduced, we had a bill that was in, or that budget was passed. There was a bill that was introduced with 47 sponsors that would extend zero fare. And so we're in the situation like, okay, should we spend this money when we don't know whether we're even going to need uh, the, this equipment? And what I don't want us to do 
um, is have us sort of tie our hands so that for the next 10 years, we're going to be having a fare box system that first off has no use to us if we're going to go down the zero fare route. And second off, if we do go back to fares, we're not going to have time to look at what is the best uh, fair system that we should use, which gets to the <coughs> point, which I think is probably more important for me as a bureaucrat. I like good governance. Good governance takes time. And so if we want to make sure that ridership doesn't uh, crash, we're going to need to make sure that we go through the process of identifying vulnerable populations, um, identifying the mechanism for how we would verify these populations, how we would give them uh, a reduced rate or a free rate. We also <laughs> need to do the work to figure out what is the right fair amount for those folks uh, who, uh, who are able to pay. And so we've been talking about uh, the fair fair approach. And those things take public comment, they take public input, and I, I just don't want us rushing towards uh, putting this in place uh, and then having it fail because we are unable to, to take the time uh, to do it in a, in, in, a, in a way that it really deserves. Um, so that's the focus on the bridge funding. And, uh, uh, and I think that that's the, where we need a decision sooner than later just for the reasons decided. When we look at the bigger picture of whether zero fare is the, uh, uh, the right thing to uh, uh, for, for urban and perpetuity, um, I won't go over the stick factors um, again because uh, we, we heard from that. Uh, but we have a situation where if right now we are in the top 12% of small transit agencies in the country. There's 319 and only 12% have four stick factors. If we lose these stick factors and reintroduce fares poorly, we could end up having a net negative loss in revenue, and and that you know, you know that's a, a a possibility. I think it probably won't happen, but I think that we will lose at least one stick factor, which means that we just aren't going to get a very good return on investment for those fares. Um, the other item that uh, I want to mention is that. Uh, during the VTANS's presentation on uh, zero fare, uh, it was presented that there was $36,000 worth of costs uh, for GMT to return to fares. Clearly, there was a disconnect in, in our understanding of that task. I don't understand why that was reported. That $36,000 is for things like banking supplies and armored car service uh, and things that we would need to, uh, the smaller items that we would need to purchase. We also would need to fill a vacant finance position because we will literally have tens of thousands of financial, tra uh, uh, financial transactions that will need to be uh, uh, go through our process. We'll have to devote an FTE for a journeyman mechanic uh, to work on the fare boxes because especially the fare boxes that we would need to purchase to quickly are high maintenance load. Uh, we have about 832 hours of salaried staff time counting money instead of managing uh, the software licenses themselves for $65,000. So when you add up all of this, the, the cost to operate is, is uh, about $333,000. One of the things that we also would probably need to do to give you an idea again of how lean GMT is, we don't have an IT manager. And so to have all of our buses having a system on place that's going to be using credit card phone payment, you know, I'm going to be looking at the specs for that system, but I'm not sure that we're not going to be able to do that without an IT manager. And that's going to put the costs uh, up to probably about $450,000 uh, uh, to do uh, for our operating costs. And the, the thing that I'll close with is that you know, all right, well, if you see a financial cliff coming, it's going to happen sometime. So, you know, you have to accept that, you know, someday that day will come. What I also know is that this group here and VTrans is, is going through the process now of rethinking how we are going to operate with a shift away from the gas tax. And that work will be happening in the coming years. And public transit would be a great, you know, whatever methodology is used to replace revenues for the gas tax, that would be a great 
option to support public transit. And my hope is, is that if we push out that financial cliff far enough, uh, that we may actually then be in a situation where there's alternative funding uh, means identified for public transit. So we don't go over that cliff. We don't have to cut service. Um, and if we have to internally fund uh, the uh, extension of zero fare, it, that's just not going to happen. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. All right. Thank you. This is this is really helpful to get this more detailed look. I think you heard from the committee that we needed to have a deeper dive into understanding, um, you know, to get into your business a little bit more, frankly, you know, and so appreciate um, the, the level of detail and how, um, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing is that one of the ways to stabilize the funding is to get uh, GMTs to get those up to that, that can yield 1.1. And the way to do that is through a thoughtful approach to fair boxes. Absolutely. So, um, I, so I'm going to, I want to give the rest of the committee some, um, some time to ask questions. We're not going to be, you know, we're, we're next week, we're off for town meeting break. And it's really the following week where I'm anticipating the committee will be, you know, making decisions when you say that there's a time sensitivity can you explain that for me to me a little bit well just the time sensitivity that we're not i i don't want us to have to make an order of any equipment we've already, actually already bought about eight thousand dollars worth of equipment just because it was something that was going to take longer to get here than the other items i don't want us to have to purchase any more equipment until we have some clarity on whether we need fare boxes or not and so the sooner we have that clarity, then the sooner we're going to be able to act to, to order that stuff. So it's not there's a specific time. It's just- We just need clarity about what, what the leg legislature is, uh, is, is in, sub in support of it. Um, thank you. I think we do have some questions. So um, Representative Couch yeah. and Representative Dodge, and Representative Burke. And then we'll go from there. <laughs> and, and Madam Chair, uh, it, and that, I think it was a purple line showing uh, the income from fares. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, within that, is that money that uh, the university provides or the hospital provides for their, you know, a little over a hundred thousand yeah. dollars is from uh, businesses or it's uh, from the unlimited access plan, the CAPMA plan, which we can actually use for local non-federal match. Um, but uh, yes, that is included in that purple line. And and what are some of the uh, businesses that you know that would uh, you'd go back to? I guess if we went back to collecting fares, that's UVM. UVM, St. Mike, Champlain College, I believe dealer.com is part of that. There's some other businesses. Local uh, founders. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Representative Dodge. Uh, yes, hi. I, um, to me, that that purple line at the bottom, um, and I know, I've, I know I've, I've, I've said this before in our committee, and I know that I'm in the minority, um, but it, it represents um, the p putting cost of public transit, putting that cost of transportation on the backs of the poorest people in our state who have no other choice. And that inflexibility that we see of the money going back up represents massive sacrifices that people will make to get back to fares. And it's hard for me to, um, to see that. I hope that we can do a lot more partnerships with private uh, entities, with, with all these groups. Um, uh, you know, I see that this job is a really difficult <clears throat> job. I also don't want it to come off of um, the drivers um, and for them to lose, to lose their benefits. They're providing a crucial <clears throat> service in our communities. Um, and so, if I've muddied the waters because I've been, no, no, you know, me. tooting, trumpeting zero fare, and you keep hearing zero fare in this committee, um, you know, because of me, <laughs> or or people that I've been talking to, um, you know, I certainly also understand that you don't want to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on a on a pointless fare collection system. That makes perfect sense. Um, I, I just didn't want it to go down without without a whimper at least. <laughs> well, let's but let's. I think <laughs> Representative Dodge, I think you raise a really good question. These are the folks to ask about. It. I think you're hearing Representative Dodge's concern 
that we are that we are imposing fares on the backs of some of the uh, most vulnerable providers. And can you help us, the committee, really clearly understand that? Because my, my, I think I have a, a different understanding that the most vulnerable Vermonters currently can be subsidized within that, that that is not who that is. But please help us understand that best, because you are the ones delivering the service, and I want to make sure that that's clear to the committee as we are deliberating on this. Thank you so much, and, and I apologize that I forgot in my introduction that uh, demographics of, of riders has been something that we've discussed, and um, we uh, um, discussed last time that uh, you know our data is old. So I started doing some research about what's happening in other transit agencies, and I'm not quite ready to uh, provide that to you. But what um, what we do know is that the ridership uh, in um, uh, the urban zone definitely is more diverse. Um, it's definitely folks who are on the, the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And what the research that I've found um, so far has shown is that in the rebound for ridership, buses have returned back uh, to ridership levels faster than the other modes. And the reason for that is because bus riders tend to have fewer options than folks who are taking the train or the commuter you know, rail. And so, and so I think that when you see GMT's rebound, we're not back to pre-pandemic levels, but we're close. The, the reason for that is because the people who are using it, that is their primary option. Representative Dodds, do you, do you want to have follow-up questions? I want to yeah, give this I was, the time. I, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I, I really did read through the you know your your survey results, and I and you provided um, these are from 2014, two, right? The, but there was also a 2012, right? There was a 2012 and a 2014. Is yes. that is that right? Yes. And I I you know this was a really in depth rider survey that was done, and and with a lot of caveats of like, well, we did these interviews in the morning, so this would capture commuters, or this would capture you know, and and so we do have kind of a two years it's true they're 10 years old but that's because COVID hit and we can we can do surveys um so you know it is all we have but but you know the numbers at that time really did seem to bear out what you're saying and when you know if if one rides the bus you know GMT services in um Essex or Burlington or Winooski or Williston or South Burlington, even communities that we don't think of as being, you know, urban or, um, you're gonna see outsized, you know, BIPOC populations, you're gonna see, you know, which which bore out in your, in your demographic study, um, which, you know, was my first question. Tell me about the riders of this so that I understand whether you know, if we're giving, we're proposing to give $6,000 of electric vehicle aid benefit, right, rebates to families that make $100,000 a year. And so to me, <laughs> I'm really trying to understand the, um, you know, the cost benefit to our communities and the weight, you know, within our budget of, of what what's really, what, how are we really going to best serve our state? How are we best going to serve our taxpayers, you know, those dollars? Is, um, so, um, there's, there's been nothing that I have seen um, in my time, both on the bus and uh, in, in public comment uh, sections that we have, that makes me think that we are any less diverse or serving a more affluent population than we were in 2014, if anything, it's the opposite. Okay, I note Representative Burke has a question too. Um, yeah, I appreciate this conversation. So if we give you $1 million, that'll get you to January 1st. Yes. And at that during that time, mm -hmm. you will be purchasing fare boxes? Yes. With some of the million dollars or with something separate? With se separate funds. Okay. And, and so I'll, I'll let you finish your question. Yeah. Okay, so you do that, you start the fares, are the fare boxes going to be set up? I think we've talked about this before, I just want to clarify, so that people who really need a free ride would be able to do that. And then my next question is, if those people are getting a free ride, 
do they count in your in your count of ridership? Would that in, in, you know affect your money extra money that you might get? Yeah, and, and so I think that um, it would improve in our accounts because what we would be able to do is provide people, whether a card or through their phone, if they have a phone, um, a way that we would be able to vet them uh, previously that they're eligible. And then when they use that card, it would track that separately so that we know hey, 75 people who um, the disabled veterans, you know, uh, requirement use the bus today. And, uh, and they could ride for free. And they could ride for free or a reduced rate, and, and that's depending right. on the income level. And figure out how to exactly how to how to make sure that those cars got to people who needed them. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, so Representative Shaw, thank you. Sorry. Fine. Fine. So Nick, uh, can we go back to the maybe the first or second slide that you showed? Uh, you had a twenty cent factor uh, for. There's yeah. this one. Yeah. This is the breakout of this one. Is a fun. Could you, could you make it? Can you zoom? I don't know if you can. Not, not, not the other zoom. Zoom in. <laughs> uh, let me see here. How do I do that? Okay, right here. Is that so you can yeah, see. Can you see it? Okay. So, like, yeah. so in the, the urban board. division, you have a twenty cent. Factor uh, is that a contribution factor? Or, yeah. What so twenty cents of every dollar. Um, this is according to FY twenty four. I want to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Our next year's budget. Yeah. Um, we are budgeting to come from local uh, sources, meaning they're going to be coming from Burlington, from South Burlington, Winooski, all of our urban member. Sorry, Hinesburg. <laughs> you know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, all of our local member towns. Yeah. So we we talked about a little bit about that with uh, with Clayton. Uh, last time he was in, and I think I made a statement, I think it was backed up by Rip and McCoy, that every, almost every town in Rome County contributes to Marble Valley, uh, Marble Valley Rapid Transit, MDRT. And so we just happened to have a town report last week, so I scoured that for our contribution from my town mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to MDRT, and it's, we, we, we contribute $1.66 per person, man, woman, and child, for the MDRT for their services. I, I think you'll find that pretty common throughout the whole, uh, our whole county. How does that, I mean, 20 cents versus $1.66 on the surface, just on the surface, uh, doesn't look like a fair comparison. And, but before you get into that, you know, one of your first statements was, and I always get a little nervous when a financial person says to me, I need to keep two sets of books. It conjures up a whole, bit, whole different meeting there. But I, I understood yeah. that yeah. it was kind of comical to me. I could rephrase that better, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second set of books is usually not one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I regress. So, so back to that point. Sure. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, this is uh, according to all of the revenues that are coming in. I think this is maybe a better chart, which shows the actual dollar amounts coming in. So we, we expect to, you know, collect uh, roughly $3.6 million from all of those uh, member communities. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, it's still not really enough. I mean, we're able to um, operate in FY24 because we have COVID relief funds um, to fill the gap of our deficit and, and non-federal funds. Um, and uh, as I said before, if we didn't have that, we would be looking at 10% assessment increases for all of our urban members. And I think uh, Phil probably wouldn't be just, supportive of that. And <laughs> just a quick back of the napkin. Heinsberg uh, pays ten dollars per person. Oh, good. And then so toward a Thank GMT. You. Thank you for doing that. And, and I actually don't know uh, the breakout for all of the urban oh. members of what that is. Uh, that would be interesting, though. To, to that was that was a question that, that we yeah. asked. Just wait, yeah. just wait, just wait. Yeah. That was a question we asked Clayton to answer for us when he came back. That's. And uh, so, and we'll move on from there. Uh, so, are we, for Clayton, are we the only door you're knocking on in the building? No. Have you been to appropriations? Uh, I've been making sure that Patrick Brennan, um, who has transportation, um, is there, and uh, we will be doing uh, much greater outreach to the representatives in our service, urban service area. Uh, so, that I, think, they, I think you should knock on appropriations door officially because last year you're through the magic of budgeting, yep. your 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 one was it one point two? Yes. Last year came came from the appropriations bill, not from the transportation bill. 
and I think that's maybe a door that. Happy to talk to uh, Representative Lanfear about that. Yeah, you might want to. And it's Lanfear. Lanfear. Oh. <laughs> if you're going for money from her, you better, I better get it right. <laughs> better get it right. Thank you. I did uh, want to let folks know just for the discussion that that $3.6 million, $1.8 million comes from Burlington. And so half of that comes from Burlington. And then looking at uh, just doing a quick calculation on my computer. Um, 3.6 million divided by 156,000 residents in Chittenden County. It's $23 per resident uh, is, is what all of those contributions. So it's pretty significant. Great. I know Representative Walker had a question. I was on long that lines and on that piece. I thought from the testimony when you were last year that these member towns of who supports you and who doesn't was part of what you were going to present today. What are those towns and who chooses to support and who doesn't? And there was discussion about who has routes and benefits without having contributed and perhaps I missed it. But I do appreciate the clarification on the 3.6 million. But I thought we were looking to go see a chart of who, where that comes from. Because we're focusing on urban, there's an entirely different mechanism for the municipalities with an urban than it is in rural. And so for urbans, we essentially, uh, GMT, uh, because of statute, we have the ability to assess um, almost like a property tax. We could say, hey, you know, Burlington, this is your amount and that's what they need to pay. Outside of that, um, you know, like for example, uh, Barry City, you know, their contribution is $35,000, you know, dollars. It's a voluntary contribution. Um, that, uh, so it's just a very different uh, funding scenario. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and I do think that eventually over time, we probably need to, if possible, considering that there are two very different FTA programs, uh, to get those in better in alignment because there is an equity concern that I have. Well, I can appreciate that there's difficulty in coming up with the numbers and which column they file into, but having asking for a financial, asking for money with only a partial picture of where the money is come from and what's available to you is difficult for me to review and, and to understand when I thought that the conversation yeah. was pretty clear, especially when it came to towns like Colchester and other places where it was really left still unanswered from the last time that you were here until now. Um, so I, asking for money is a difficult thing, but understanding at the same time where your money else comes from and what other options that you have, um, I thought we would have seen today. So Representative Walker, are you looking for to unpack that slide for more detail? Because that's what I thought in the testimony was pretty clear um, through what Representative Shaw just said and what Clayton was here last time that we were going to see what the contributions to the local portion was. Can we, by can we advance to that slide? Because I just, sure. So I just want to be clear. And by the way, this is uh, missing Colchester. I'm noting on it right now. Who's a non-voting member? They're actually not. That's why they're not included on this. But the towns where the assessments are coming from are from Burlington, South Burlington, Wind. Newski, Essex, Shelburne, Williston, Milton, Hinesburg, and then these, uh, Washington County, Lamoille, these are the rural commissioners, so that's on the rural side. Um, the total dollar amount, um, as Clayton just said, is uh, $3.6 million. It represents about 20% of the budget. Um, so that would be who we were we would go back to um, and actually have the authority to make to assess on. Um, we do receive uh, uh, some small local operating assistance funds from a few other towns, but we don't have the power of assessment. They're essentially looked at as donations. So, so just I'm just wondering because Representative Walker wanted a finer level of detail. Is that something that from this slide you could un? Could, so I can certainly send that. Like, could you send that to the committee? So are you looking for how much money each town is giving on the urban side? That's what he's looking for. Yeah. Yes, okay. I'm looking to see where you're. I thought it was very enlightening that half of the money comes from Burlington. I think uh, Representative, one of our other members of the yeah, committee, we can, was pretty clear on how much he felt his town was contributing. I think there's quite a bit of discussion, but I, I thought that we had already had that. Um, we can, um, we can certainly, so that's the I mean, I can direction show, that I'm going. show you that right now. So, um, Thank you. Oh, if you can have it right yeah, now. Yeah, I have better. it. So, but, you know, let's do it in real time. We're, we are, committee, we are going to take a break, but I just want to let us to be able to wrap so, this up. Um, to be clear. So these are the total amounts right here down at the bottom. So. It's not listed. Oh, it's not showing. <laughs> my, my apology. Maybe you already have it all. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I have it. I have it. I don't. So how do I get rid of this PowerPoint then? Um, so if I just close that, maybe. 
And now oh, I gotta stop this share. There we go. Yep. Oh, okay, great. So okay, so right here, total Burlington, Bolchester, these are the dollar amounts. So 1.8 comes from Burlington, uh, 591,000 from South Burlington, Essex gives 315, Winooski gives 227, Shelburne 107. Uh, 255, 38, Heinsberg. Sorry, this isn't the cleanest, but I, I didn't have this ready to go. So th those are the dollar amounts. That's great. I would love to and, see. And you, yeah. So and and we're happy to get into finer levels of detail. That's a compilate combination of assessments for fixed through ADA capital, and then Burlington has a couple special ones, like they have the College Street Shuttle, so they give an assessment for that, and a couple other things. So Burlington is a little more complicated, but the others are pretty straightforward. They're just fixed through. Okay. We're asking for an involuntary contribution from all Vermonters for specific towns and I want to know who that's yeah I guess yeah no problem to. yeah and if there's any other like I said please reach out I'm happy to provide whatever information you want so final questions of Representative Lally and then I think Representative Corcoran yeah so uh, you know as everyone knows we have a housing crisis and I'm wondering what you guys are doing or if anything to partner with towns that have uh, GMT service to assist them with leveraging transit-oriented development opportunities along the routes. It seems to me a, a central problem of this whole paradigm that we're discussing is the low ridership. And the goal is to get people who have choices, I think that's the whole goal of electrifying everything and just all the things we've been talking about, multimodality, is to encourage people who have other choices to choose greener forms of transportation, which the bus is that, I mean, fantastically, right? So, and, it, and you can use your fixed routes in urban areas. So I'm wondering, are you coordinating with um, uh, the various entities, yeah, ACCD, the, the RPCs, um, and then just the municipalities about these opportunities? In Shelburne, where I live on Route 7, the state came through and fixed it up a number of years ago, and we have, um, uh, uh, dedicated bus slips, you know, which do not impede the traffic. It really it makes it very nice. Um, I wish we had more bus shelters. I think that would help. And, and, and also um, crosswalks. I have some friends who have been trying to take the bus who don't have to, and they've kind of given up because it's just, you know, it's not convenient, it's not pleasant, um, and there's some safety challenges. So it seems like some low hanging fruit that way. I can tell you that GMT is very closely partnered with the regional planning commissions. And in fact, um, when you look at our rural areas, the planning commission is the ones who set our commissioners uh, from that area. And I do know that we have worked very closely in Chittenden County, specifically with the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. And some of the new developments, um, part of the permitting process was actually a, re uh, a reduction in parking spaces with the assumption that there would be GMT service uh, that would provide uh, transportation for there. So I, I don't feel like I could talk more intelligently than that on the topic right now, uh, but I'd be happy to include it uh, with our uh, additional information. I think uh, coordination with land use in the urban areas would be extremely helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna bring us back a little bit to, to, the, to the ask that's before the committee. That's helpful background, but I wanna bring us back um, before we break, I know um, because we did ask you to come in to kind of unpack your ask and to give us a more detail, which you which you have done. And I, Representative Corcoran, did you have? Yeah, man, it was just more of a maybe a clarification. You know, Clayton, you said you know you're talking about the uncertainty about the fare boxes, and you don't want to go ahead and, and buy them before it's um, you know, required. But um, it's unfortunate that you think it's an uncertainty because if you were here last year. Um, the sentiments by the chair and the Senate Transportation, Transportation Committee was pretty clear. There was no wavering <laughs> on where they stood. Uh -huh. um, so, but fast forward, we are where we are today. Um, you anticipate that fare boxes are eventually going to be on board. We're just talking about whether we do it now or in January. Yeah, so why not go ahead and just order them? Do these go bad? Well, actually, the reason is that there are other systems that may actually we want to migrate to. For, in fact, there is an all tablet based system uh, that would uh, be much easier for us to maintain, much lower cost. Um, the, the issue then is we have to solve the problem of cash payments. 
Um, and that would just require a little bit of time for us to do that. And so I do believe that if we had extra time, uh, then we would uh, go through the process of identifying an alternative that's not a traditional big chunk of metal uh, uh, that sits at the, at the front of the bus that requires uh, uh, you know, our mechanics to spend time on. And so that, that would be one of the reasons that, that a little extra time could mean that we have a solution that's going to be much easier for us over the next 10 years. Sure, I'm just saying, why hasn't that, why didn't that start last year? Why aren't you doing that now? You know yeah. where we're headed. Yes. I, I, what I can say is that I've been here seven weeks and I'm yeah. moving in that direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers, but it's just sort of, you know, sort of frustrating. You're saying, well, the hold up because we're not sure. I think we're all clear that, you, you, you know, we're going to go back to fairs. The question is when. But in the meantime, just you do the due diligence, get your, you know, uh, things that you need to, you know, have lined up. And with all that being said, I'm not saying I'm not for extending it for a little period of time. I just want to make that clear. I'm not against that. I'm just I curious of why you're not going full force ahead. I can, I can tell you that I appreciate your concern. And I could also say with, with no disrespect intended to my process or, or others, I would have handled the situation uh, All right. Well, this has been really helpful to the committee, and I think the committee got um, our questions answered. I think uh, about uh, the direction um, and what 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 uh, what the ask is to help GMT transition. So, appreciate you making the time to come in and to thank you our questions. So, yeah, thank you. And I will uh, put a slide together with the breakout of the towns and put it in the presentation on when I. Great, that would be, that'd be terrific. Yeah. That would be terrific. And then we can, if you send it to Jeannie Lowell, our committee assistant, um, she can forward it to the committee and on our webpage. So we are we were scheduled for a break. I think what we're going to do at, at 1030, so we're running a little late. And our next testimony, I think, uh, was going to, we're going to squeeze something in before 1115. So what I'm saying is I'm going to, we're going to, Drop Chris Roop. He'll be back in. Um, uh, we're gonna we have testimony eleven fifteen. So um, if people can be sure to come in ten minutes at ten after, like really promptly, because the folks are are joining us remotely and our committee assistant is working remotely. So it's really helpful for the committee. So we have a longer break, but um, please come in at ten after. Okay. So with that, we can end the live stream. And we'll be back at eleven.